Uh, okay. Gets back to cover class. Why are they the cornerstone? Yeah. Um, Elliot Coleman says to uh, precede brassicas with onions. And I've done it and been real happy with brassicas. Now I haven't done a trial to see if, it, if I'm just doing well with brassicas, period. But I've always wondered about that because the onions are so fungal and the brassicas are so anti-fungal. Um, well, I think onions are, are thought to be one of those crops that just leaves favorable conditions. Okay. So it's not fungal and, by bacteria, it's just favorable. Well, it, they're, they're fairly fungal. Uh, I mean, they're very mycorrhizal. They, I mean, they've actually done the experiment in India where they took the world's most costly weed. It's called purple nut sedge. Fortunately, it's too cool here for it so far. We'll see about climate change, but we don't get it around. We get yellow nut sedge. Anyway, they had uh, an outdoor experiment. It's a containerized experiment outdoors where they planted onion, which is one of the most, as an onion set, one of the most world's most weed-sensitive crops, and purple nut sedge, one of the world's most aggressive weeds either one or both in soil that was either mycorrhizal or non-mycorrhizal. And the non-mycorrhizal soil with both of them growing, they basically documented that the mycorrhiza was stealing some of the nut sedge and energy and giving it to the onion, you know, essentially. I don't know if it was physically moving starch from the nut sedge to the onion, but it was so favoring the onion, and it was mildly parasitic to the nut sedge. The onion was actually holding its own. I mean, go figure. I'm not, I'm not saying depend on a mycorrhizal inoculant to control purple nuts as an onion, you'll, you'll lose your shirt. But it was an interesting trend. It was a fascinating. <clears throat> anyway, I'm really getting off a million tangents. I'm going to get these cover crops. Um, so the first thing that cover crop does is what, what its name says. It covers the soil. And when you've got leaves over the soil and you get a downpour, the, the, the raindrops hit the leaves and then they trickle onto the soil rather than smashing onto the soil. You, you get one of those big drops that's big enough to sting a little bit when it hits your face. When it hits the soil, it'll blow apart the crumbs and it'll start crusting the surface. And on a moderate slope like it got back out here, if you have bare soil and you have one of those 30 minute thunderstorms with about an inch of rain, you're going to get erosion, period. But if you have a cover crop that looks like that, you won't. And the other thing is the roots, especially the grass roots, which are fibers, any fibrous root will hold the soil physically against uh, erosion. So you'll have both, so that even if you have so much rain that you just have runoff even though the force has been broken, uh, if you've also got a nice fibrous root system, you're not going to lose soil. Um, adding organic matter, um, in a cooler climate, a crop like that will add as much organic matter as you need to replenish what's burned up in a year of production. In other words, if you have a, a thick, heavy, grass legume cover crop like that, alternating with your vegetable crop, you will be breaking even probably on organic matter. Down here, uh, and that might be true up here in, in uh, Asheville and the warmer parts of the south, um, the soil organic matter burns up faster, so you might need a bit more, might need a second cover crop, or might some compost or some uh, mulch as well during the um, production crop. Uh, but the feeding of the soil life, um, all plants do this. So if you have if you have a patch of if you have a, a, an idle bed, you're better off with it being weedy than bare. With one caveat, there's some weeds that are just so invasive, there's some invasive got exotic weeds. I don't want to see cuds growing in that bed or other than I see purple nut sedge. But if you got Palmer amaranth, I mean, it's a terrifically aggressive weed. It's got all the conventional farmers running scared from Arkansas to Georgia because it's resistant to uh, Roundup. But what do we care, you know? Just be sure you cut it before it makes seeds. You know, as soon as you see any sin on a flower head, whoosh, you know? But leave it there as a mulch. If you're not going to grow anything there, you don't have time to cover crop. Uh, but if you really want to be feeding the soil, and you can imagine that the peas are fixing nitrogen, the triticale has got those fibrous roots, the ground is completely permeated with roots. So, and every day that's fixing, let's see, that was, it fixed five tons per acre of organic matter on the above ground, so it means another couple of tons probably came out the root system, or one, one ton easily. Um, so that's just feeding the, the soil life every day, you're keeping the soil very vital. And then of course when you terminate it, you got this grand feast, 
Now, you wouldn't want to try to incorporate that much of a mass all at once. We'll talk a little bit more maybe later about how to, when you grow all this biomass, how, to, how do you deal with it. Um, another thing is there are a number of wonderful things about cover crops when it comes to nutrient management. One thing to remember is that um, nitrogen does not, uh, soluble nitrogen does not stick around in the soil. There's one of four things. It goes into the plant, it goes into organic matter in the soil, or it volatilizes to the air as nitrogen, nitrogen oxide, or ammonia, or it leaches down to the groundwater. It just does not stick around. I mean, you can, you'll have a little bit of soluble nitrate and ammonia any one time in the soil. But if you have, if your system has provided 100 pounds more nitrogen per acre available than the crop needed, it's either going to get bound up in the organic matter or it's going to be lost. However, if you have surplus phosphorus, which happens very often because plants only use one pound of phosphorus for every eight pounds of nitrogen and every 10 pounds of potassium, and your ratio on a good compost might be more like 3 1 3 rather than. 8, 1, 10. So if you're putting on compost to provide your nitrogen, you're going to build up phosphorus, and that will stick around. Uh, some, not necessarily in a soluble form that will show up in the soil test right away, but it'll stick around. The potassium also will stick around. Generally, it'll get onto the cation exchange capacity and will build up. So the interesting thing is if your soil is testing a little bit suboptimal in phosphorus, your legume cover crops and your buckwheat um, will improve the phosphorus availability. And the interesting thing is buckwheat, is an, uh, that's another non-mycorrhizal family. Buckwheat, uh, rhubarb, uh, the dock weeds, the sorrel weeds, uh, the knot weeds, the smart weeds, all of those, the uh, bulginaceae, they, they are not mycorrhizal, but they're pretty good at getting phosphorus. They have other uh, symbionts that help them release the phosphorus. So, you got legumes and buckwheat making your phosphorus more available, and the grasses are really good at breaking potassium out of um, some of more insoluble forms than the actual cation exchange. If your cation exchange loading on potassium is a little low, I mean, you wouldn't want to get to very low range, but if it was kind of medium or somewhat low, and in a deep, spreading, fibrous grass uh, root system, and trees are pretty good at this too, is they can get some of the reserve potassium out of the minerals that you don't see in the soil test. So just by growing these cover crops, you can sometimes make your soil test P and K go up. However, soils can sometimes get excessive in one or both of these. And what happens then is the cover crop will not aggravate that ex excess. It says, oh, there's plenty of soluble stuff around here. We don't need to, you know, go to great lengths to feed mycorrhizae to break phosphorus out of solid rock and don't have to secrete extra acids to break potassium out of solid rock, the soil is loaded with it, and they're not going to aggravate that excess. So they're an excellent tool for soil man uh, nutrient management. You always have to replenish organic matter and nitrogen, and a grass legume or a grass legume form from a crop will always do that. And it'll tend to ameliorate low availability of the other nutrients without causing an excess. And of course, there's the pest control aspects of cover crops. And that comes in three or four different forms. One is weed control. You, I mean, we're saying that weeds are nature's response to bare soil. It's like bare soil, oh, it's covered up. Let's grow something. Let's make sure the earth is protected. So we do it. We do it ourselves with a cover crop. We choose a crop that's going to come up really quick. We're going to cover it, um, include some grass of some kind, like a small grain, make sure that that really holds the soil. and. So we put the weeds out of work, basically. Secondly, when you've got a cover crop flowering like that, especially buckwheat that's got just excellent um, nectar, is you're providing um, food and habitat for beneficial insects who will then eat pests in your native crops. Um, just by having enough buckwheat in the field, uh, just planting at different points of the season, um, often reduce several pest species. Uh, they often attract the uh, Pennsylvania leatherwing or soldier beetle, and they're really good on cucumber beetles and some other pests. Uh, lady beetles like to come to those, lace wings, and uh, those will eat potato beetle eggs and caterpillar eggs. So, uh, and the third way is just 
by putting cover crops in your crop rotation and diversifying your crop rotation, you're breaking up the life cycles of diseases and pests as part of uh, designing a rotation to uh, keep those undesirable organisms from building up. Okay, so now we're going to go through uh, some specific cover crops as well as the virtual tour. Uh, a little bit more on buckwheat. It covers the ground really quickly, uh, mobilizes the phosphorus, and the nectar plant, as I said, for the beneficials, and quite strong weed suppression. This is only two weeks after, after planting. So if a pigweed tries to come up in there, it's in the shade, it's going to have a hard time coming through. Now, pigweeds sometimes do break through because they roll vertically very quickly. I've seen them break through a really heavy cover crop. But you will definitely have a lot less weeds in a buckwheat crop. And also, Buckwheat has been shown to be somewhat allelopathic, which means it's, it releases substances that inhibit the growth of certain other plants, including quite a few weeds. And when you want to use buckwheat is during the frost free period, and it's really good for short fallow periods. Like if you've got an early lettuce crop, and you want to plant beef, but you're not ready to, you want to plant it in six weeks, plant buckwheat. Especially if you've got, I mean, it's especially timely. If you get to a point where you have uh, you just take your lettuce crop out and you start to get a flush of pigweeds and lamb's quarters and those summer annuals that could be a real nuisance. You know, till those in and you know, I would uh, broadcast the buckwheat and then do a light tillage to incorporate the buckwheat and knock, weeds, knock out those little weeds. The buckwheat will come up and then when the weeds try to flush, they're in the shade already. Uh, and it's pretty good for the farmscaping. Uh, you got like a large diverse garden like that, you have a little patch of buckwheat here and there. And at different times through the year, plant some in April, some in May, some in June, some in July, some in August. Um, one thing about buckwheat, um, okay, here's some tips, you want to sow usually 75 to 100 pounds per acre, about uh, four inch deep. You could uh, broadcast it real evenly and work it in shallowly with a rake or a rubber rotor or set as shallow as you can. Or you can drill it, drill it in uh, fairly narrow rows and not too thick in the row, otherwise you get very densely planted kind of rows and wide spacing that uh, the buckwheat will try to sell all the weeds. Um, although it is a, a warm season crop and that, it, and that it's frost tender, it also doesn't like drought and intense heat. And 10 years ago, I would have said to Appalachian growers, you can plant buckwheat any time in the summer and it'll go thick, uh, thick and lush and choke out your weeds and get 30 inches high and give you a ton or two of biomass per acre. Uh, with global warming, you might find like a July planting will be kind of thin, burned up because it has to get pretty hot and dry. Um, it does decompose quickly, it doesn't leave a lot of residue, so it's not one of those crops that's going to be a terrific erosion fighter. Although while it's growing, it will prevent that rain splash. Uh, it does sell seed, which you can use by, if you, if you have a weed problem, I would say grow the buckwheat until you can see a significant number of mature seeds. Those are dark brown. And then just go out there and disc it down. I mean, don't try to till it in to get a clean seed, but just disc it down. You'll plant your second crop. You've got another wake of buckwheat, and you'll reset the weeds back. Um, however, if you are terminating the buckwheat with the idea of planting something else, and there's some seeds, it can be a mild weed problem. And I say mild because they're easy to pull out. They're not extremely aggressive unless they're thick like that. I mean, occasional buckwheat plant here and there. I've got buckwheat in my clove and my peppers, and I've been weeding them very selectively because they're probably pulling in beneficials. And where I think once you start to shade the uh, pepper too much, you just take it out and cut that. Now, this is garden scale. Uh, big farm scale, you got to keep in mind you know, what can you do with machinery. Uh, you might learn from experience uh, just how much buckwheat you'd like volunteering. And, kind of fine-tune how you do your seed bank. Or you might say, okay, that buckwheat's been flowering a week, I'm seeing a couple of light green seeds, it's gonna be mature, I better disc it down today so I don't have it coming as a weed. Okay, starting with Sudan grass, um, kind of the queen of cover crops in terms of biomass, but it's um, kind of um, also needs a lot of fertility. It's a, it's a queen in that sense. It's, it's got very high standards. If you try to plant it on poor soil, you get about this tall and you get more weeds than sorghum sedan. But one of the nice things about this is that, so suppose you have access to manure and you know you don't want to put on compost and manure on your production crops because it's not 
it's not really good food safety wise. And if you're certified organic, you can't harvest anything called organic for 120 days. But if you say, well, I got this load of pig manure, I don't have, I don't have a means to compost it, and it stinks, and I want to get those nutrients on the land and get them stabilized, put it out about five, at the most 10 tons to the acre. You want to go moderate on manures, but you put it out a pretty good dose, till it in, till it in a few inches, plant your sorghum sudan, and that stuff is going to just grow really quickly, and it's going to tie up all those ni all that nitrogen and phosphorus and keep it for your next crop. Um, very high biomass. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about sorghum sudan is its root system is both deep and fibrous. And what that means is um, you get the deep subsoiling when you're breaking a hard pan. And it's a coarse fibrous, so they're very strong roots. They'll penetrate a hard pan that will stop most plants. And then because it's fibrous, it'll also hold the soil at the surface, so you'll get that erosion control. Um, now, one thing it doesn't do is it doesn't really close canopy quickly. It's kind of open because the leaves are slender. It's like corn. It looks a lot like corn. And so it's often good to plant it with a legume or maybe buckwheat, uh, a warm season legume. Um, it's a very strong scavenger for nitrogen. Uh, as I said, uh, it's such a heavy feeder and the roots go deep. Um, it does suppress some pests and everything, which is very handy because um, some of our vegetables are, sent, are susceptible, like the tomato is susceptible to root knot, and there's several other nasty nematodes that can attack grapes or other vegetables. Um, so if you know you have a bit of a nematode problem, just growing around with, uh, this, this crop can often knock them out. Um, it's a really good summer fallow. Um, you really want to wait until the ground is warm. Uh, because it, 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 uh, the buckwheat will come up in cool soil as long as you're not in the frost period. But you really want to have warm for sorghum, sorghum sedan. And one of the other things that's really useful for is growing mulch material. Now, you don't want to let it just grow unimpeded until it's in head. It could jump a very woody stalk. But if you grow it up so tall and you have uh, soft leaves, you can come through and um, cut that as mulch and then it will regrow. Uh, you will not be able to kill this crop by, by mowing or rolling, but the upside is that it, it can be a real mulch factory for you. You can be cutting and using it to mulch another bed. And then another thing is every time you cut, if you leave it a fairy, I mean, that's a, maybe a little taller than each, but you know, if you leave at least a six inch stubble, when it regrows, it's very, it'll grow over like vigorous kind of bushy, it's called ratuni, and it sends the roots deeper. And the physiological response is to grow those roots even deeper. Mark, what do you cut in that with a lot of garden scale? Oh, I just took a sickle or a scythe. I mean, I wouldn't mind, sorry. You've been a weed eater. Weed eater, yeah, a scythe or weed eater. I mean, I wouldn't mind taking a scythe to a patch of uh, sorghum sedan the size of this room, but I wouldn't want to try to take on an acre. <laughs> yeah. Get your scythe nice and sharp, it's not that bad. It's quieter than a weed rack, whacker, safer. Um, Mark, we, we have a lot of trouble around here finding untreated. Sorry? We have a lot of trouble finding untreated sorghum. Uh, sorghum sedan? Yeah. Seven Springs Farm. Well, okay, but I just also learned from Ron Morris about Coffman Seed. About what? Coffman Seed, and they have very competitive pricing. Good. Coffman Seed? Coffman Seed, yeah. K A U F M A. -A oh, Coffman, yeah, yeah. I've heard of that. Okay. Um, so let's see about this, I mentioned the fertile soil. Um, if you were to grow just straight sorghum sudan grass, uh, and then actually, especially if you try to till it in at some point, you will tie up soil nitrogen. You'll need to provide more nitrogen to your next vegetable. So I, I would recommend in most applications to grow the sorghum sudan with, with cowpea or other legume. We're going to see that I think, in the greenhouse. Um, I mentioned the road, uh, and it's quite drought tolerant. It's much more drought tolerant than buckwheat, much more heat tolerant. It likes the heat. Uh, it will get killed by the first frost. Um, so you can frost kill it to create an in-situ mulch, like for garlic. But to create an in-situ mulch for something you can to plant during the summer, you can't really mow it or roll it. It'll just come back. Pearl millet, um, many ways, this is one of my favorite cover crops because its biomass is almost like that of sorghum sedan. And it's much more tolerant of lower soil fertility. Like if you have really poor soil, it's not going to do great. But if you have, you know, there's medium in all the nutrients, there's medium in organic matter, and you kind of think it as fair quality. You know, pearl milk will do 
find. And, it, and it's extremely drought tolerant. It's more drought tolerant than the sorghum. It's much more drought tolerant than corn. Uh, in fact, it's grown in the Sahel region of Africa, which is on the edge of the Sahara. And they grow pearl millet to make sure that their women, their uh, nursing mothers and children will have sufficient nourishment in a, in a bad spell because it will yield the drought of the, the grain varieties. Uh, cover crop varieties, we often grow a, a, a grazing hybrid, which does not form a lot of mature uh, fertile seed. Uh, it grows tremendous biomass. You can cut it and have it grow back if you cut it early. And again, you, you can use it as kind of a mulch generating uh, crop. But if you let that head out and cut it, you will kill it. So it's, it's easier to match in that respect, too. It's very versatile. We like it. And I've seen it yield um, more than five tons per acre. It, it's right up there with surface, and it's also about, it's about as tall. Um, and you can plant this, you can plant both of those grasses up until about the end of July and still get a very respectable cover crop. I planted July 22nd in Floyd and measured four times per acre before it frost killed in October. Um, those are tips about how, you know, so in 10 to 20 pounds per acre is very tiny seed. And I found up from experience if you want to plant it with a legume, you want to go to the lower end of that. I planted 20 pounds per acre of, of millet and uh, an alternate rows of soybeans. And I came back with a solid stand of millet. It was 99% millet, 1% soybean, and 0.1% um, weeds. I mean, there's no weeds in it. And, uh, so it would be, say you were using it to, to keep yourself options for the later season. Better choice than say sort of. Or if you're going to go in and plant before the frost date, like you know, plant fall brassicas, yeah. um, I would actually. If you let it hit out. Yeah. Another thing is in our test, this didn't have quite as high a C to N ratio. It had a little more nitrogen in it. And in fact, that one stand where we didn't put any fertilizer down, I mean, it was good soil, though, no doubt about that. It was biologically active. Um, but I figured that the biomass uh, contained like 160 pounds of nitrogen. It was like just pearl millet. And, and it was like 1.6, it was 1.6 percent nitrogen, which is high for grass, especially on grass and heading. And uh, it was 1.6 um, percent at 10 tons the acre, uh, 5 tons of the acre. And I thought about that and I did some research, some, some reading, and some of these tropical grasses, including the penicillins, the, the, the pearl millet uh, genus, will actually fix some nitrogen by associating with these other bacteria. It's not as tight an association as a legume nodule, but they figure that as much as 40 pounds of nitrogen can be added. So instead of tying up nitrogen, this is going to be more nitrogen neutral. A little bit like oats, which tend to not have some dumb like carbon ratio. Um, but I, again, I would recommend going this with, with uh, a legume. Right here is quite a sun hen, which is a tall legume. And I, uh, I didn't actually include it in this presentation, but I went in there, cut down, got my biomass sample to, to measure the biomass. I got four tons per acre again. And there was, I mean, the weeds amounted to a few little seeds that high. That was it. So, um, and extreme drought tolerance and heat tolerance. So uh, it's going to be an ace in the water. I wish, I wish it was more widely available. Ron, I said, Ron, why don't you, why doesn't seven weeks carry a pearl millet? Um, and the answer was we can't find any. Um, let's see. And it does apparently have some of that same root response. If you cut it during the vegetative stage, the roots will go deeper. And again, fairly deep fibrous roots. Foxtail note, this is one that's often available at local southern state stores. Uh, this is a useful one. It's a little well, it's, uh, lower growing. It's closely related to giant foxtail. There's a lot on giant foxtail because it's not weedy. If you can go to seed, the seed will the deteriorate over it. You don't get a lot of cell seeding. Uh, very easy to manage, very easy to kill it at heading by uh, mechanical needs. It gives about three tons per acre in about 60 days. Uh, I noticed that on those two other previous grasses, the four to six tons was on maybe 75 days. So it's a little longer season. Um, but because it's such a dense fine grass, it makes a nice mulch. It's uh, good uh, weed control. Um, Canyons well with uh, cowpea or soybeans. 
Um, but you want to plan it before the summer solstice. It's already too late to plan this year because there's a daylight response, and if it comes up when the days are always shortening, it'll just give you a small plan. It won't give you the biomass. 